Okay, everyone, thank you to kickstarting the Sustainable Recovery, the Climate Group's Sustainable Recovery Series in partnership with Innovate for Climate. Today, we have the World Bank Outlook 2050 Strategic Directions, supporting countries to meet long-term goals of decarbonization. Please make sure to mute your audio and turn off your video. Submit your questions or comments using the WebEx chat box. This webinar has been recorded and a recording will be available on the I4C uh, website. And if you're sharing on social media, please use hashtags sustainable recovery and innovate for climate. We're gonna start with some opening remarks for Jürgen Beckley, Vice President of Sustainable Development World Bank. We'll also have some country voices and some World Bank experiences. Thank you for joining us today. Jürgen, over to you. Thank you, Isabel. Um, it's great to be here. Wonderful to see you and be connected. I'm excited to join you this morning to launch this report on long-term decarbonization and how we in the World Bank Group are planning to support countries plan for a cleaner and more sustainable future. Obviously, there are many reasons why we think this really, really matters. And we've discussed this within our team and of course with many of our partners that are on the call today. And maybe let me first say how the COVID crisis has made it so incredibly clear to most people that we are far away from a sustainable planet and from a sustainable econ economic system. Just think of the water services. Hundreds of millions, billions of people lack inadequate water services. There's no sustainability in that front. Uh, food is the other one, food insecurity. Uh, while we have enough food on the planet, we don't have a sustainable way to actually feed everyone on this planet uh, in, in, in a timely manner. It's again, hundreds of millions of people suffering today. And then with the fact that we don't have sustainable social safety nets, only about one third of the population right now has access uh, to, to cash transfers at the time when they, when they really need it. But it's also equally clear to, to many people, and I think Europe's leading the way on this, to really say, look, this is a once in a lifetime opportunity, once in a generation opportunity uh, to get things right and do them better. We don't have to go back to the old normal of heavy brown skies of unbreathable air, of degraded forests, of food systems that don't feed the poor and nourish the poor, of cities choking with congestion and unequal access to essential services. So I think this notion that the SDGs, that this desire to get uh, all of this done in, in, in a sustainable way has become much more prominent um, to many. Of course, we have two sides of the conversation, those who say now is not the time and those who say this is the best and maybe the last chance that we have to get this right. I mean, the second reason why we think this report really matters and, and, and why, why this is important is to emphasize that it helps avoid, um, avoid harmful lock-ins in investments, right? If countries only focus on short to medium term targets, they will make decarbonization costlier and, e and more difficult over the long term. And now I'm focusing a bit more on, on, on the climate angle to this, which is, a, which is a very significant part of the whole sustainability agenda. And I think so for us internally in, in the institution, we are having lots of conversations around how do we think about not just the, the three to five year horizon, but the longer term um, the, the, up until 2050 in the kinds of support that we provide to countries right now. We have an internal uh, discussion in, in the institution around our development policy loans and have made an agreement uh, with a number of the regions and uh, many of the, the country units that SD, the sustainable development team, which uh, our team represents, will be a part of the conversation for every policy loan that is going forward, just to make sure that we don't um, invest in policies that emphasize technology that should be phased out or that put, uh, you know, take very good policies away that are already existing that, that support kind of direction. So I think that's a very important um, second message. COVID also teaches us the importance of understanding who is vulnerable and why. Uh, as I said, it reiterates the need to invest in the basic services, and I've mentioned those. It really uh, emphasizes the, the value of long-term planning in the face of uncertainty and how preparedness and precautionary action can keep people and communities safe. 
uh, it's very it's very clear that we have never invested enough in preparedness. Uh, this is an, an, a conversation that's been going on for a long time. I've been around for more than 20 years. This whole notion of pandemic preparedness. Uh, we've now had four pandemics in just the last 20 years. Fortunately, not all of them were as, as horrible as, as the COVID, but the next one could be worse. You know, and so now is the time to really think through how do we avoid this happening in the future? How do we prepare? How do we lay the foundation for facing the next one? So. That, together with the arguments uh, that, that I uh, put in place earlier, I think, are really a conversation to have. And this report provides a lot of background to this and a lot of basis for this conversation. So we, the report lays out what long-term decarbonization will look like, and I think it offers clear suggestions for new frontiers for TA and lending for us as an institution and hopefully for our partners as well. So I hope you will find the, the report interesting. I hope you will find the discussion inspiring. There's a lot of conversation going on, how to do things better, how to do things differently, how to avoid the mistakes of the past and how to learn from each other. And again, as I mentioned in Europe, there's a lot of positive uh, policy thinking and implementation going on. So I hope we can bring all this to the table and we have a fruitful conversation. Thank you very much. And back to you, Isabella, and maybe Bernice is online as well. Right now, I don't see her yet. Not yet. We're actually here. Okay, Isabel, over to you. So please proceed. Thank you. Neha, over to you. We'll just give her a minute to get um, the presentation up and running and the mic switched off. These are the, the, the real time challenges of, of doing this virtually. Thank you, everybody. It's nice to see so many people joining. Um, we've shared the link to the report in the chat box, so please do check it out. Um, and we'll be sharing more information in that chat box as well. Please use it to send messages uh, or questions, which we will try to get to uh, in the course of this discussion. And if we don't get to them in this discussion, um, we will uh, uh, try and respond uh, after, after the presentation is over. Great. Thank you, Farzina. Just checking in that the slides are visible to all. Good. Thank you. Thank you, Jürgen, for that excellent opening and introduction, uh, especially as it relates to the current context and how this report presents some of that initial thinking. Uh, thank you all for joining today, and uh, I'm really glad that we're here to discuss it. I'm Neha Mukhi, Senior Climate Change Specialist at the World Bank and a lead author of the report. Uh, and we're here to discuss uh, and the virtual launch and uh, some of the key messages that have emerged from this work uh, that led to the development of the World Bank Outlook 2050 Strategic Directions Note, which lays out how we can support countries to meet long-term decarbonization. We are in a very different time now compared to when we started this work uh, a year and a half ago. However, the current crisis actually creates an even more pressing need to think through how to align immediate priorities with the long-term goals of decarbonization. We know that the current context, uh, or uh, broadly speaking, the climate change poses risks to economic growth, to macroeconomic stability, and to development outcomes. The current pace and scale of climate action, as we know, are insufficient. Uh, for example, the NDCs are not ambitious enough to meet the goals of uh, climate mm, action. Our global greenhouse gas emissions are continuing to increase, and we still need to invest more in adaptation and resilience. The current context of the pandemic actually makes it even harder for us to balance uh, the long-term priorities with immediate, uh, with, with immediate uh, necessities and needs uh, to respond. But that also means that it's even more important for us to think through why long-term decarbonization matters. Long-term strategies actually lay out a vision for sustainable growth. They help us boost economic growth and create jobs for the future and avoid stranded assets. They boost investments in resilience. In fact, that's an excellent way to send out clear market signals to attract private sector financing and help uh, and ensure that countries can actually maximize the use of their own domestic resources. They also help to enhance cooperation across different ministries, given the nature of these long-term strategies, and across different stakeholders in the economy. So as we, as we embarked on this report on the World Bank Outlook 2050 in developing this, 
the key thing that we, uh, the team set out to examine was how the shifting needs of countries for development and for climate action need to be looked through in an integrated way, and how can the World Bank support countries in meeting these uh, goals of development and decarbonization through transformative actions that bring about uh, the, the change, uh, the shifts that are needed. A key message that emerged from the report was that action needs to happen at two levels, the top-down and a bottom-up approach. The top-down being a broad uh, a set of economy-wide actions that create an enabling environment for investments to actually materialize across sectors. Examples would be looking at embedding climate change in macroeconomic frameworks, into national budget planning and expenditure frameworks, looking at financial sector regulations and how they can incentivize investment, and also going through all of this using a systems approach to acknowledge the trade-offs, avoid these trade-offs, and in fact, uh, focus more on the synergies of these actions. The bottom-up approach would look at uh, essentially cross-cutting solutions that can uh, advance actions that help bring about transformation of systems that are much needed to be on the path to a decarbonization. Take food systems, for example. Jürgen had just highlighted food systems go beyond agriculture. It's about feeding uh, the growing demand uh, that's coming through, but also growing that uh, produce sustainably. So it includes everything from farm to the table and everything in between, which includes the supply chain. Having a sustainable supply chain and avoiding food loss and waste would be critical to meet this growing demand sustainably. Another example to think through would be the water systems transformation, for example. Water systems are particularly vulnerable to climate change impact. But the sector is also a growing source of emissions as we go forward. So any measures that we invest in for reducing emissions must be prioritized for delivering adaptation benefits as well. And I must highlight, this was one of the key messages that came out. Majority of the cross-cutting solutions can actually deliver decarbonization, and when designed and implemented through a systematic way, can have significant adaptation co-benefits as well. Another example that I'd like to highlight is the digital transformation. We know that technological innovation and digital solutions are helping advance low carbon action across sectors. But the digital sector, the digital infrastructure itself has a significant carbon footprint of a growing carbon footprint of its own. So greening the digital infrastructure will be critical so that we can continue to unleash the power of these digital technologies and that can help deliver low carbon decarbonization solutions across all of these cross-cutting areas in the economy. Now let me go a little bit deeper into these cross-cutting solutions to give you uh, some idea of what we propose as possible action. Uh, I don't want you to be distracted by the amount of text on this slide. The details are in the report, and we really welcome you to look through the report in detail. But I want you to focus on the specific actions that are included in the uh, rectangle boxes. The white boxes show actions that are cross-sectoral in nature. They have cross-sectoral linkages. And the green boxes, the colored boxes, green, yellow, uh, purple, are actually sector-specific actions. Now, these are specific actions that were identified across the cross-cutting solutions for transformative action. As is very evident in this slide, majority of the actions that can help deliver transformative climate solutions are actually cross-sectoral in nature, which ties back to the point that I had earlier made that we need to think through and uh, enhance cooperation across different uh, ministries, different actors, different stakeholders in the society to be able to efficiently deliver on these solutions. Now, we've talked about solutions. It's also very important to think how we can deliver these solutions. At least from the context of the, in the context of the World Bank, delivering these solutions would require looking <laughs> through our country engagement strategies, our uh, operational uh, engagement through lending and technical assistance, and also looking at how to enhance our internal resources and capacity to ensure that we can deliver effectively. 
in terms of these capacities, it's important to highlight global partnerships and uh, skill strengthening would be important to help deliver on these solutions. Tailored plans that are uh, tailored for regional and country context would be absolutely essential to make sure that we have very context-specific solutions. Financing these implement, uh, solutions for implementation would mean looking at the entire range of upstream technical assistance to develop these solutions and for implementation of these solutions through concessional resources. And not to undermine the importance of innovative financing and policy support that actually creates an environment, sends a market signal, which brings in, which bring, crowds in private sector finance to scale, uh, to, to deliver these solutions at a higher scale. Last but not the least, I want to highlight a point that is particularly relevant in the current context. Crisis response and how we can think through integrating long-term priorities in this. Whether it is about responding to uh, natural disasters like hurricanes or the current pandemic, there are uh, several areas where, uh, support, uh, where financing, where uh, resources are allocated uh, in terms of response and recovery. And if these are designed and thought through to be aligned with the long-term objectives, that helps us fast track, that helps us move faster along the, object, uh, along the path to meet the objectives of our de decarbonization and development goals. Now, before wrapping up, just one uh, thought to think through. Large volumes of public resources are typically channeled into countries, into economies, to help stimulate growth to help stimulate recovery. And if these resources are further intended to catalyze private sector investments to spur economic growth, these actually can be a very strong uh, instruments to send the right signal to create the enabling environments and spur investments that are aligned with the long-term goals without having to later go further and invest more in correcting our course to move back to the goals of decarbonization and development. So with that final note, I would like to wrap up and I would like to thank you all for joining us today. This is the link to the report, which is also available in the chat window. I invite you all to please uh, take a read, uh, think through and hope this, these messages were helpful for you. And with that, I will turn it over to uh, our colleagues. Uh, if I believe uh, Bernice Van Bronckert will be joining us now. Uh, as the, she's the Global Director of Climate Change Group and will be moderating the panel session with Country Voices. Thank you. Thanks, Neha. Um, unfortunately, Bernice is still running a bit late. She sends her apologies. She will be joining to moderate, uh, hopefully, this, the second round of questions. Uh, my name is Farzina Banaji. I'm the Communications Lead for Climate, and I'm going to fill in for her until she's able to join. So I'll, I'll just sort of thank Neha and thank Jürgen for the framing comments. Um, particularly, I think the, the background of, of COVID uh, and, and how the sustainable recovery uh, can be kick-started and, and particularly thinking not just about sort of short-term needs, but how do we also add in longer-term objectives and, and meet those. And thank you, Neha, for the report, which points out some of the ways in which um, countries can, can do that and how the World Bank can support them in that journey. So I'm very pleased um, that the panel today highlights experiences from countries that are actually already undertaking this journey. Um, I'm going to ask each panelist um, if they can keep their answers to my first question to about three minutes, because we do have a, a second round that we'd like to come to. Um, what I'll do is introduce each speaker very briefly and, and then ask you a, a question, and, and I'll just go through the, um, for, for a few in, in turn. So first, allow me to welcome Deputy Minister Arifin Rudianto. Thank you very much for joining us. Minister, Deputy Minister for Maritime Affairs and Natural Resources from Indonesia. Um, Minister, Indonesia has been at the forefront of, of low carbon development planning and, and particularly this high ambition climate element in the medium term planning process that you've undertaken. Um, can you tell us a little bit more about that and how it's helping to lay some of the foundational elements for longer term strategy? Christina, in Indonesia, as well in the global, energy is a global threat causing significant negative impacts for Indonesia, direct and indirectly. Since the last 10 years, 
hydrometeorological related disaster event have dominated the disaster profile in Indonesia, causing human casualties and huge economic loss. As part of global community, we certainly would like to contribute on solutions to reduce greenhouse gases emission while also maintaining our strong economy. Balancing the effort to reach climate and development objective is the earth of low carbon development initiative. That is one of the main reasons why we include the CGI as a big development agenda in our midterm development planning 2020 to 2022. As a uh, response to COVID-19, other measures with much better paradigm that we use this as tagline. LCGA provides more avenue for all sectors to transform their business as usual practices into more sustainable and low carbon development. LCGA policies ensure that all climate development related policies, targets, and strategies should be implemented accordingly to reach Paris Agreement commitment in 2030. And meanwhile, to reach our long term. Uh, ambition that we develop in Indonesia 2045 vision. Certainly, in this cannot happen in a day, and there is a just transition process that we have to manage in order to push our related sector to walk in the same direction to reach 2045 vision. This need times. However, we assure. You all that we have laid down a strong foundation through LCA in our midterm development planning started from 2020 to move in the right direction. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I, it wasn't totally uh, audible this time, but we will have a recording of the uh, of this event. So I would encourage folks to tune in again, and, and we can make sure that, um, that the sound is higher on that. Um, now, if I may turn to um, Minister Pilar Garrido from Costa Rica, the Minister of National Planning and Economic Policy. Minister Garrido, last year Costa Rica released its National Decarbonization Plan, and this is really widely regarded now as a model for many countries. Um, can you tell us a little bit about how the short and medium term objectives were, were built in, were reconciled with the longer term climate goals and, and what process is underway to, to integrate now this long-term plan into economic policy? Good morning. It is a pleasure for me to be sharing with you long-term how our long-term strategies and in this case our decarbonization plan is allowing us to fast track priority actions as a key thrust of the recovery plan. We have, uh, for us, it has been extremely useful to have this long-term strategy ready as now it is guiding our path for the recovery plan. Governments can actually take advantage of the, on the new post-COVID recovery phase, linking it to climate change objectives in two ways. We have been uh, thinking about achieving synergies between the new normality and the new post-COVID economic recovery through climate change resilience and action. And the second one is planning the recovery of the fiscal situation with green eye criteria. On the first one, our president uh, recently said that the pandemic is an accelerator of change. This is how we see it. The crisis stage accelerates the development of certain urgent areas like health, economic and social areas, as well as the environmental discussion and dimension. In the case of Costa Rica, we have the possibility to use our decarbonization plan as a central piece to address the COVID crisis and to recover better. The decarbonization plan is this uh, roadmap for us for the new development of social and economic and also uh, environmental model, as it is also responding to the demands of the fourth industrial revolution, and at the same time responding to the climate and biodiversity crisis in a systemic way. Uh, we have highlighted that it needs to move forward towards a sustainable economy that does not harm natural capital, the need to be based on digitalization, decentralization, in terms of electricity and the production and decarbonization, and also establishing a basis uh, guided by science and how uh, to be zero net emissions in 2050. Our plan establishes different sets of policy packages. We have for the short term in 2022, we have other actions for 2030, and our longer actions for 2050. 
And they have 10 main focus on sectorial areas and eight cross-cutting areas. So we have sustainable mobility, zero emission flat fleet, logistics and efficient cargo transport, renewable energy and competitive cost, low emissions industrial sector, circular economy, low carbon food systems, and low emission livestock, nature-based solutions. And for each of these, we have goals, concrete actions, and projects that are, have been allowing us to transform our development model. We understand that decarbonization and resilience are not a burden, but are the way to transform our development model and to set a new direction. I am very willing to give you more information as this webinar progresses. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, now I would like to welcome Deputy Commissioner Andalka Chusume from Ethiopia, the Planning and Development Commission of uh, Ethiopia. Mr. Andalka when you look at long-term decarbonization for Ethiopia, we'd love to know a little bit about how the, the dialogue is taking shape in the country and particularly what is being done to build consensus around why this kind of long-term strategy and, and strategic planning matters. Thank you, Farzina, and uh, uh, thank you so much uh, for organizing this event. And uh, the report was uh, a very good one uh, and informative as well. Just for, for the question, uh, I just want to focus on characterizing what's going on here as to how is taking shape in Ethiopia. Uh, four points characterize uh, what's going on here with regards to the long-term low greenhouse gas emissions development strategy. Uh, the first one is uh, we strictly uh, follow the theory of change. Uh, in fact, the long-term perspective shaping the near-term uh, plans and actions where emission reduction targets uh, influencing the medium and short term uh, our plan and action. Uh, and that gives us uh, a very good insight on uh, promoting investment in businesses uh, across uh, the economic activities and leverage innovation as well. The second point is the integration. This is uh, the major uh, direction that we are following. Let's is not a standalone uh, uh, initiative in, in our context. Uh, we follow an economy-wide integration of uh, the agenda uh, and the low emission as integral part of our development plan. Currently, we are organi uh, organizing a 10 years perspective plan where uh, six uh, pillars are included. And one of those pillars are the climate change, uh, climate resilient economy. The third point is deepening the context uh, consideration uh, in uh, integrating this issue as our uh, integral part of our development plan we have to make sure that the agendas economic agendas are uh, you know overshadow the issue of uh, the climate uh, details so for that context we have an anchor we have anchored the three bases base, international commitments, national strategies, and national development plans are the three areas, the basic areas that we are focusing to make sure that this agenda is not overshadowed by other uh, agendas. The last uh, point is the institutionalization. We have uh, a coordination task force which strictly follows this activity across uh, the country. Three institutions, relevant institutions are uh, uh, coordinating, co-chairing this platform, uh, Ethiopian Forest Climate and Climate Change uh, Commission, uh, uh, Planning Development Commission, and Ministry of Finance, and seven other relevant ministries like uh, Ministry of Health, Ministry of Mines and Petroleum, Agriculture, Water and Irrigation, and Energy, Trade and Industry, and Urban Development Ministries are member of this national task force that are following these activities. So this is how we are following as an integral part of the development plan uh, in nationwide. Back to Frenza. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, next, I'd like to welcome uh, Ingrid Holden, uh, Director General from the Federal Ministry for Economic Cooperation and Development in Germany, that's VNZ. Um, Ingrid, we'd love to hear a little bit from you about the key priorities for decarbonization that have been identified in, in, in Germany's development cooperation. And, and can you shed some light on how that those priorities are being implemented? 
Thank you, Vestina. Um, many thanks for having me, and congratulations to the World Bank, the bigger team, for this excellent report, which really comes out at, at the right time. We have already listened to those front runners in implementing long term decarbonization visions, especially Costa Rica and Ethiopia and Indonesia. And I think uh, it's a pleasure for us in Germany really to cooperate with those countries and to provide the right support. The first thing is actually the type of transformative areas that you have identified and in your report also very much resonate with our development priorities. Especially, for instance, for Africa, it's the energy sector. Uh, we still are facing in Africa, for instance, a huge issue of access to, to clean energy. So um, certainly there the, the key point is going to be in the longer run whether we can achieve a decarbonization of the sector and at the same time deliver on SDG 7 to bring clean energy to every, um, to every family in, in rural areas, make sure that we respect the Paris goals at the same, same time. Um, the same applies, for instance, for the transport sector. It was a pleasure, really, that through the World Bank facility to support NDC implementation, uh, capacity could be provided to Costa Rica to uh, elaborate, actually, the new transport uh, strategy that really leads to decarbonizing the sector, and this is really unique. Um, and I think these types of um, areas are quite important, the transport sector as well. But let me perhaps, Zina, um, underline two, two aspects. I think it's quite important what has been raised with respect to the right institutional platform to look into the longer term uh, perspective. Um, therefore, we consider, for instance, the NDC partnership that is now being co-led by Costa Rica and the Netherlands as a very unique partnership because it brings together all at the country level all the ministries that are involved in really in implementing the goals of the Paris Agreement. Because we know that, for instance, decarbonization means this is a cross-cutting issue. It cuts the cost, it goes to the transport sector, energy sector, the agriculture sector. So all these ministries have to sit at one table and make sure that by this cohesive approach, they can really make sure that Paris, the Paris Agreement goal can be, can be reached. Within the NDC partnership, and we have started to provide additional support to member countries for greening their economic recovery. This is now a unique opportunity, as you have said. I mean, the cent can only spend once. And now a lot of money is being actually mobilized for emergency and stimulus programs. So it's a huge opportunity if we really weave into those programs the greener elements and make sure that those stimulus programs at the same time um, actually uh, support the longer-term goals embedded in the SDGs and the Paris Agreement. Second, of course, decarbonization is important. But let's be frank, we also have to deal with the other side of the coin. And this is especially, we have to deal with resilience and the issue of adaptation to climate change. We have to make sure that our societies become more resilient against these more frequent shocks, disasters, and additional risks that are being provoked either by new emergencies like pandemic, um, a pandemic crisis, or, I mean, the longer term risks that are embedded in climate change. So the other side of the coin, and this is embedded in your report as well, is really that we have to invest much more in preparedness activities. We have to be more innovative when it comes to disaster risk finance instruments. And I think there the international community has to step up its effort. And, and Germany is really putting a focus in this respect. Thirdly, multilateral development banks, like the World Bank, are really a key player in this endeavor because you can actually bring together the respective financial tools, capacity building, and the knowledge that is embedded in your institutions. What is key is actually that those MDBs really are becoming front runners in implementing uh, the right strategies and actually providing developing countries with the support that is needed to achieve the Paris goals. I think that certainly we would expect um, and that throughout the crisis that we are now facing and thereafter in the economic recovery that the MDBs actually carry the torch to make sure that actually any additional cent is being spent in a wise way and that we really find the sweet spots between the recovery that is needed to overcome the impact of COVID-19, but at the same time really 
to do service uh, to the goals of the Paris Agreement. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ingrid, and I think that's an excellent uh, uh, sort of point at which I can I can ask. I'd like to ask each of the panelists um, to to sort of comment, you know, in one minute, if if you don't mind, um, on on sort of how, based on your own respective experiences, how institutions uh, uh, like the World Bank, but also bilateral partners, can actually help develop, shape, implement achieve these kinds of long-term decarbonization goals, especially to sort of shape a sustainable recovery? I think, Ingrid, you may, you may have already answered that question. So um, maybe I will ask uh, Minister Dianto first, and then I'll, I'll, I'll pass through the others. Thank you. Uh, Minister, you are still on mute. Um, if We'd love to hear from you on how, from Indonesia's perspective, uh, you think institutions like the World Bank can, can support these long-term decarbonization processes? No. Okay. International communities, uh, multilateral development bank, including the World Bank and other bilateral partners, have significant role to support countries in achieving long-term decarbonized goals. Investment packages provided by development partners should shift from brown to a green investment, including in the current recovery phase of the pandemic. Development partners also could provide support in know-how and technological transfer for developing countries in achieving their ambition decarbonized Target in the long term. That's uh, our experience. Thank you. Thank you very much. Mr. Garrido, you're still on mute. Thank you. There you go. <laughs> Thank you, Nell, for us. Uh, the, the, we do believe a lot in multilateralism, and as the Minister of from Germany mentioned, NDC is a key aspect of it, but also how we can leverage and build upon the support that the that multilateral organizations bring to the table. For instance, uh, we have been working a lot in leveraging the dynamism of public investment in order to, to build climate resilient works. And this we have been doing as well with multilateral organizations and promoting new productive activities of green growth that comply with this vision of 3D, decarbonized, digitalized, and decentralized and allow for the rapid uh, post-COVID recovery for its high added value generating new productive, a clean and, and resilient uh, productive matrix. So this we have been working as well with the World Bank and also focusing on a new areas from our productive matrix as for instance, now we, our map extends all the way uh, in terms of sea wires, in terms of the ocean, all the way to Ecuador. So this is also a very a interesting opportunity for us, and in this sense, the World Bank has been supporting the work we have been doing in terms of looking out for the for the blue economy as well and the green economy to leverage the package of policy that we have been putting into place for post-COVID. And uh, perhaps one last uh, thing I'd like to say is that uh, this vision also, in terms of the, the fiscal vision of, of the greener uh, fiscal uh, situation from our countries, is how to incorporate in the recovery loans and how to incorporate uh, in the in the um, in the uh, uh, support that we have been having from from also from this all these lines of of budget support that we have been having from multilaterals, how to incorporate in those loans also performance indicators that are aligned with climate change and that can actually help us uh, work better and accelerate in terms of adaptation, but also uh, mitigation in terms of how resilient our economy can be. So I believe that in this way also, and generating uh, prioritizing funds for environmentally friendly economic activities as well, this is also very important here. Thank you, thank you very much. Mr. Indakichu, love to hear from you. Thank you, Ferzina. I think this is, uh, the, uh, Climate is one of the very strategic areas that needs uh, a very genuine and strong global partnership. And uh, above all, working as a close partners is uh, what is uh, needed uh, in our view. 
if you take, for example, there is a lot of uh, efforts has been done here. We have uh, a very accl acclaimed strategy called CRG. Uh, it has been a decade since we started implementation, and a lot has been a lot. A lot is uh, being done. Uh, if if you take the green legacy, the three plantation uh, projects that we are running last year, we did uh, four billion uh, seedlings, and this year five billion. And uh, light rail uh, tra transit, uh, clean energy projects, and the GIRD even the Great Ethiopian Renaissance Dam, which is uh, pursuing uh, a green, uh, clean energy for the country and the region. A lot is going on on our CRG strategy, where still we can put uh, three points. The first one is technical supports from development partners. Through institutions in charge, we, uh, nine ministry offices and institutions are directly or indirectly involved in this uh, activity. PDC as uh, a platform or co coordination in, in collaboration with uh, our forest and climate change commission and uh, in areas of like model, modeling stock taking on our crge calculations of emissions you know we did the calculations uh, long ago and such kinds of technical supports like mrv monitoring and re uh, reporting and verifications on the on the area technology and material assistance as well as financial supports it, there are specific packages that we can uh, engage with the partners which is ready, uh, that can be supported out through our coordination task force. Thank you, Rosina. Thank you. Thanks very much. Um, Ingrid, I, I, like I said, I think you, you actually already answered the question in your first intervention, but would you like to give some quick thoughts on, on how the World Bank um, can support this? I think we, we are facing two major challenges. I think we can only implement the right policies today if we really have this longer term vision in place. What is missing in many countries is really like the analytical underpinning to know exactly what kind of targets are feasible. What does this mean for present strategies and investment plans? And I think there actually international partners can give a hand as was just said um, by our Ethiopian friends. Secondly, if you want to go into the transformative areas, we need the bigger front loading of finance. Many of these transformative actions can't be done implemented in a piecemeal approach. And here again, I think what is needed is really a coordinated approach by the international community to put the, the right actually emphasis on those investment areas and mobilize the private sector at the same time. And there again, I think this is a challenge for us as implementing partners of many developing countries, but this is really to make needed in order to make long-term strategies not only a plan, but really a reality for immediate action in the next couple of, of years. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks very much. And thanks to all the, the panelists who have joined us from many different countries, many different time zones. We really appreciate that. Um, I think there were, there were really some excellent interventions. The idea of the pandemic actually being an accelerant, uh, I think that's a very powerful way of thinking about it. And, and I think really the insights of what it takes to actually make this process work, the, the levels of coordination uh, that need to take place, Thank you so much to all of you for joining us. I'm, I'm very glad that um, Bernice Van Bronckhorst, our Global Director for Climate Change, has been able to join. Um, I'm going to pass over to her to, to lead the Q&A. I know we have a few uh, World Bank discussions first. Bernice, if you're, if you're there, can, we, can I pass it over to you? Thank you. Um, thank you, Frazina, and, and thanks, everyone. And, and uh, really, my apologies for uh, for missing the beginning uh, this morning. I was uh, in a different meeting on, on, on the impact of COVID on, on IDA on, uh, and on IDA 19. So it was a, an important one to put into practice some of the things that uh, we're discussing um, here this morning. But uh, let me just quickly move over to our next panel. Um, and I'd like to introduce um, three of our uh, leading staff in the bank. We have Fiona Stewart, who is a lead financial sector specialist. Um, we have Sholi Pargal, who is a lead energy economist. And then we have Eric Fernandez, who is uh, the lead agricultural specialist. So what we um, would like to ask you is really to, um, if you could just mention and talk a little bit about what are some of the strategic initiatives underway um, or forthcoming 
um, that will further advance the World Bank's engagement to help clients with long-term climate action in your particular sector. So, uh, so let me hand it over to Fiona first. Fiona. Thank you, Bernice, um, and thank you for the, the introductions and the report, which we've uh, we found very interesting and, and catalytic, I think, from the financial sector side as well. Um, Niha mentioned at the start that um, why I think these these um, strategies are very important from the countries are very much a signalling. The, the private sector, the financial sector, needs the signalling that there are long-term goals, long-term projects, and, and, a, and a, a good stream of projects that they can invest in. And so what we're doing is really to help try and green financial systems in emerging markets. Um, and that takes two sides, really. One is um, on the risk side, sort of greening finance, and the other is on the opportunities and financing green. And on the, on the risk side, it's very much, as the report lays out, with the sort of top boxes, how do you really embed into the financial sector regulation that we need to look at these sort of risks, these climate risks? So we're working in countries like um, Colombia, for example, with the central um, financial sector regulator in Colombia to have stress testing for the bank's balance sheets so they can really understand their own um, exposure to climate risk. And with the um, institutional investors, the regulators for insurance and pensions to really try and embed um, climate ESG environmental factors into their own um, uh, investment processes and then into reporting what they do to their members and what they do to the to the, the regulator as well so really embedding on the on the risk side to really understand that this is important long term and material for the financial sector and then on the opportunity side as, as you laid out Ingrid um, laid out well that there are a lot of incredibly interesting innovative financial products out there whether it be from the green and blue bonds insurance for um, uh, natural resource insurance, um, rhinos insurance, all sorts of interesting products and ideas out there, but they're quite diverse at the moment. They're quite scattered. So what we think is important from having the national plans, how you go from these um, national climate, national adaptation plans, as Ingrid mentioned, are important, to investment plans. You need to take the next step and make sure they're investment plans. And then from that, what can we really see are practical projects that you can crowd in private sector? And it's this sort of missing piece, I think, that we need to work on between the overarching plans here and the really interesting projects here. So that's what we're doing with the um, learning from the infrastructure sector. So they have where you have kind of PPP units that take um, very high, high level infrastructure plans in a country and really work out what are the viable projects and then work on the instruments to crowd in the private sector. We need to take those sort of models for climate and for, for adaptation, as Ingrid said, and that's what we're working on um, developing in several countries now. So these overarching plans are incredibly important, and it's a very good signal and a way to crowd in the private sector, and we're helping that happen in many emerging markets around the world. Thanks, Felice. Great. Thanks, thanks Fiona. And, and, and well, since Fiona just mentioned um, taking um, learning lessons from the infrastructure sector, uh, let me hand it over to Shirley. Um, for some reflections, particularly on the energy sector. Hi, Bernice. Um, thanks for the opportunity, Bernice. It's nice to see you. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about ESMAP, which is where I work right now. This is the Umbrella Trust Fund for Energy. And uh, our work really is um, in one bit looking at knowledge generation and speaks to the idea of, you know, some of these technologies you really need to do a sort of assessment of what is out there and translate what is being um, developed into pilots, into models that can be used and to figure out how they implement it. And then the other half of the work we do is grants for technical assistance, for capacity building, um, analytic work. Again, with the idea that actually this um, embeds these processes and embeds these new ideas and I would say technologies really into our projects because a lot of what SMAP does is then translated into bank lending and, and you know that's speaking to the point raised about how MDBs um, sort of help implement these things um, you know it's a huge energy portfolio that is affected it's also now increasingly other sectors it's transport as well it's agriculture to some extent um, so I think the SMAP business plan speaks to the two, two um, pillars that are related to decarbonization, accelerating it directly, and to renewable energy. We also have a focus on 
keeping our eye on the access target, which is, you know, universal access by 2030. But we recognize very much that all that we do now has to be with the aim of decarbonizing the energy sector in the next few years. I mean, <laughs> we don't have that much time. So um, let me just highlight a few sort of um, elements of our business plan. Uh, we're focusing on under decarbonization, the zero carbon public sector, which is, you know, public sector leading by example. And you can talk about, you know, the e-mobility, you could talk about public sector buildings, you know, the energy efficiency angle and street lighting and so on. Um, industrial decarbonization, and these are really um, very hard to abate sectors like cement, steel, petrochemicals. Um, and here the work is really very much more knowledge. It is understanding what is going on and how do you translate that into, um, you know, projects or actually pre-projects almost, you know, ideas that can be sort of uh, started to be implemented in the course of our technical dialogue with countries. Um, the other aspect I think that is of great interest is um, efficient and sustainable cooling because we are in a warmer climate and we're going to have to deal with that. And um, there are many new technologies out there. There are ways of, you know, you know, the standard passive building construction, but we're not doing that in many developing countries. So we really need to think about that. And this is a uh, aim to sort of move that forward fast. And um, then there's the new technology, really new, which is green hydrogen. And uh, here again, it's a little bit really upstream of anybody implementing it, but there's a great deal of, scope. And unless you have a lot of effort put into um, partners coming together, thinking about it and um, developing models, um, how do you, you know, get the hydrogen power cells? How do you get hydrogen as a fuel being used? I think there's a lot of thinking around it and SMAP is sort of, you know, working at that upstream level. Um, on renewables, we're doing a fair amount in terms of trying to sort of make sure that the sort of standard renewables are now implemented. They're sort of our part of our core offering. I mean, you do have solar, you have onshore wind, you have geothermal. These are not things that need to be now re-imagined. Um, we are doing work at a much more um, broad level. We announced, I think it was a, a couple of years ago, a $1 billion partnership on energy storage, where, which we know is going to be essential for resilience, it's going to be essential for integrating renewables into the uh, uh, grid. It's a big uh, effort that SMAP is now spearheading. And um, at the same time, we have um, work on, as I mentioned before, um, trying to make sure that all these technologies come into our off-grid, our grid-affected solar. I mean, all of that is sort of now, our, our effort is that the energy sector does not invest in anything that is not consistent with Paris targets. Let's put it that way. Um, I can answer questions, but that's what I wanted to say. Thank you so much. Um, yes, uh, super helpful. And, and, and I'm not sure we're going to have a lot of time for questions at the end, but I'm sure we can uh, get in touch with you uh, individually. Um, let me hand it over to Eric. Eric, please, if you can maybe comment a little bit on, on particularly from the egg sector uh, perspective. Thank you very much, uh, Bernice. Can you hear me okay? Just checking. Yes, we can. Thank okay. you. Thank you very much. Thank you for the opportunity to participate. Uh, very nice to hear our, our dear ministers and, and directors talk about uh, the challenge at hand and the opportunities. I think that's what I'd like to focus today on uh, in my brief comments. Uh, our Vice President Jürgen Vogler uh, highlighted uh, you know, it's not building back to business as usual. It's how do we um, deliver more food, better produced, better nutritional outcomes, and more resilient to climate shocks. How do we get climate smart agriculture and food systems? I think that's the challenge and the huge opportunities that we have. Um, the second point I think important to highlight, and most of our, uh, our, uh, our speakers highlighted this as well, the latest generation intergovernmental panel on climate change moral projections um, reveal climate change is accelerating. This is, is clear now. The evidence is coming in very, very quickly. Um, not only that, but we're going to see a, a likely significant increase in the frequency and severity of climate shocks, such as droughts and floods, and that these are going to happen in sequence. So this what they're calling now seesaw weather. 
So it makes that quite a challenge to deal with. And as we have seen in many of our countries now, um, farmers, uh, other stakeholders of agricultural value chains uh, are really having to deal with these shocks in, in real time, even as we're speaking. Um, the, the other issue that Yogan mentioned was just how COVID has reminded us of the interlinkages across sectors. I mean, this is a 100 nanometer virus. I'm told that the human hair is 1,000 nanometers, so it gives you a sense of scale, has brought the world economy literally to a standstill. 100 nanometer virus. Um, interlinked in that is food systems, how the value chains are struggling to cope with getting food to markets, how farmers are struggling to cope, how uh, they're dealing with, uh, uh, with the shocks, just, not just economically, but also the climate shocks that are overlaying on that. Um, so when we talk with our clients, uh, an important message that we get, especially in our low and middle income countries, and I think it's worth emphasizing that, and, and Director Hooven also alluded to this, is that for many of our low and middle income countries, the SDGs are the primary goal and, and they see and, and interconnect the NDCs within that scope. It, it is a very important task that we do in the bank is to help our partners and, and clients uh, make those linkages, provide the analytics. Um, the third point I think is that, you know, how do we uh, um, adopt this transformative approach to building back? Uh, it's not gonna be easy. But we have some goalposts and we have some guidelines. And so um, uh, our, uh, our minister from, from uh, Costa Rica highlighted this very nicely, resilient green and blue integrated uh, systems, uh, you know, uh, landscape to seascape, circular economies, public and private sector collaborating, uh, community-based organizations integrated and informing and, and, and using that. So this is a, 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 a dream uh, not just a dream, but we're going to make it happen. We're making it happen. Uh, uh, green and blue in a circular economy context where we will, will do this. Now, we need the analytics to inform investment priorities and scale. Uh, Director Hoven uh, highlighted that very nicely. And in the bank, in the agriculture and food global practice, we've just put together a, a, the elements of a trust fund whereby our donors will help us to to um, get the finance that we can then quickly transform um, uh, for helping our clients on the analytics and on the deployment of, of, of the important value chain uh, and, and, and interventions. And just to conclude, I think I, I, I don't want to take too much time, but uh, in terms of actual numbers, in the bank, so in the agriculture and, and food portfolio, uh, we have about $20 billion now. and of that is in in for resilience building and mitigation. So we've got this co-benefit two approach, integrated approach. Um, and, and by 2025, we're going to take that to about 66% of our portfolio will have this resilience building and, and, uh, and, and adaptation and, 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 and mitigation, excuse me. Um, we hope to reach about 20 countries and 10 million farmers. So that's quite a challenge, a target, and that's where our, our, our multi-donor trust fund is going to help us to do that. And then finally, I think it's it's worth sort of just um, highlighting the fact that we've got at the moment about 30 climate smart agriculture profiles for our countries. We're helping the countries better understand the challenges and and food systems and what are what are the opportunities. Uh, and support from donors has been very important in helping us to launch climate smart uh, investment plans. These are the CSAIPs. We've got about $2.5 billion currently committed in CSAIPs, uh, and we're looking to ramp that up very, very quickly. So lots of opportunities, big challenges, but we are ready to roll. Thank you very much. Thank you, Eric. And um, really with apologies to the audience, uh, because I think we have run out of time to ask specific questions, but. Before closing, I did want to just give the final word briefly to Neha, um, who's obviously been uh, leading um, this work uh, on behalf of the bank. So Neha, perhaps a few closing remarks, uh, you know, following the, uh, the, the, the really rich discussion that we've heard so far um, before I close today.
Nina, I'm afraid you're still on mute. Sorry, we have two mutes in my computer. Sorry about that. Uh, thank you, uh, Bernie. Thanks a lot for uh, moderating an excellent discussion. Thank you all to all the participants here. I just wanted to quickly wrap up by saying one specific uh, idea that has been at the forefront of this. For all the countries uh, that we're engaging in and across the board, mitigation and adaptation are equal priorities. And this has been embedded throughout our work, how to also deliver adaptation uh, benefit through mitigation actions and decarbonization actions. So this integrated approach has really been helpful to think through long-term goals and integrating these uh, actions into our near-term priorities. Even in the current context of the crisis, we're already seeing actions where, for example, health center electrifications are being prioritized through off-grid solutions and mini-grid solutions that further spur uh, and support growth in these sectors that are currently suffering from lack of investment. From a recovery perspective, we are seeing liquidity facilities being designed to support utilities that, uh, that are suffering because of reduced revenues, because of reduced consumption. And that is also uh, an avenue where new thinking is emerging to use those facilities to spur investment in low carbon solutions and resilient development solutions. So I think the main message that came out of our work was that it's very critical to think through this in an integrated way, near term, long term, adaptation, mitigation, along with development priorities. And that's the only way we can truly uh, have transformative, transformational impact. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Neha. So with this, I'm afraid I'm going to have to uh, close this, um, this really interesting session. I really, first of all, want to thank the team for you know, a fantastic job. Uh, really, really interesting report that, that clearly is going to be the basis for much of our work uh, focusing on long-term strategies uh, in, 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 the, in the year and years to come. Um, I also really want to thank all of our um, government uh, speakers who uh, gave their time and, and, and gave really, really uh, insightful reflections, um, as well as, of course, colleagues from the bank who, uh, who took time to speak. And then lastly, I really want to thank the audience as well for, uh, for, for staying with us. I think we have um, a very, very well attended uh, event today. So thank you all for that. And of course, I also want to thank Fuzina for jumping in and moderating um, the first panel when I was uh, delayed in the, uh, in the IDA deputies meeting. So again, thank you all. Um, a lot of work ahead of us, but it's, uh, it's exciting, it's critical. And, uh, and I think we also, as we discussed today, seen a lot of opportunities. Um, in the months ahead, uh, given that we are looking at, um, at a lot of COVID response uh, programs being hastily put together. So this is something that we want to put in there. The, the long term starts today. So um, uh, it's, it's more relevant than ever that we get this right um, in the next few months. And um, again, thanks everyone. And any particular questions that you wanted to direct at uh, the bank or any of the other speakers, Please let the organizers know and we'll try and get back to all of you. So uh, thank you. Stay safe, stay healthy, and uh, hope to see some of you soon, maybe even in person. So thank you all. <laughs>